Hello everybody, thanks for watching. Um, today we're going to continue on from last video, which is where we derive the equation of motion for a simple spring mass system. And in this video, we're going to be solving this equation of motion. Um, specifically, it's a second order differential equation, which is homogeneous. And all this means is that um, everything on the left hand side is equal to zero. So that's just what we'll talk about when we're talking about a homogeneous equation. Um, so yeah, so we're going to be solving this equation of motion to try and find our x of t to, to work out where the mass is going to be at any time t. So hopefully you have some idea of how to solve a ordinary differential equation. Um, if you don't, that's okay. We're not going to go into the raw beginnings of how to solve an ODE. Uh, in this because I'd like to keep it more engineering based. There's so many resources of how to solve ODEs that um, I'm sure you can find another video on YouTube uh, or watch a watch a, a lecture that you've seen in, in class and to get a bit more of a basic understanding. So we're just going to jump straight into it today of solving this ODE. So I'm going to write down the, the long way. Once you've done this a few times, you don't have to write it out this way. But basically, we're going to assume that our x of t is equal to e to the lambda t. Um, now, this is just so that when we differentiate it, we're not changing our, our, our function greatly. It's just more or less staying the same, and these lambdas will come out. And these lambdas are just a constant. It's an, it's an unknown. It, it, it could be real or it could be complex. So we're not too sure yet. We'll find out later. So when we differentiate this, we just have x dot of t is equal to, and now the lambda comes down, lambda e to the lambda t, because the lambda is just some unknown constant. And then we do x double dot of t, and the lambda will come down again. This is just a constant, so don't worry about it. So then we get lambda squared e to the lambda t. And um, probably not unsurprising, but what we do is we take these um, derivatives of x and we substitute it back into our equation of motion. So when we substitute it back in, the equation of motion becomes lambda squared e to the lambda t. And now this is all times m plus now we don't have a sec we don't have a first derivative term in here so we don't have to worry about this so we just jump down to this x of t and whack it into the the k there so we have plus e to the lambda t keep it in brackets nice and neat k equal to zero so we just simplify this we bring the e to the lambda t outside the front and then we just have lambda squared times the mass plus k is equal to zero. All right, so this is nice. So we've simplified this equation of motion down with guessing what our, um, our x is. So when we look at this equation, we, we sort of need to think a little bit about it. Um, what we want to do is we want to ask ourselves, well, how can we satisfy this equation? How can how can we choose our lambda such that it is equal to zero? The left hand side is equal to zero. And so on initial inspection, you'll see our um, exponential term here. If we graph this out, I'm sure everyone's graphed this out before, but this is what it looks like e to the lambda t. So e to the lambda t, it never crosses the the t axis it never it never is zero you can hop onto your calculator if you don't believe me and you can plug in any number and you're not going to get zero so please play around with it and see what you get but this cannot equal zero so if this part of the equation can't equal zero then that means that what's in the brackets here must equal zero this must equal zero. Now, this equation is called our characteristic equation. K 
characteristic equation. And that's important to remember. Now it's just inside here. And that just that this is just denoting the component of this overarching equation of motion we have. This this characteristic equation is just the part that has to equal zero. Okay, so well, what's our next step? Well, we just need to find lambda because we can see that this little equation here, that characteristic equation, just has to equal zero. So what we do is we just back in our orange, we just have lambda squared m plus k is equal to zero. So now we just solve for lambda. So we just will divide the m, divide through by m, and then bring this left hand side over to the right hand side. And what we have here is we have lambda squared is equal to negative k on m. And then we just we take the square root of both sides, and then we are left with lambda is equal to minus k on m. Now we've taken the square root of both sides, and now this is plus or minus, plus or minus. So we pretty much have our solution for lambda. Let's just uh, simplify it a little bit more. You'll notice that there's a negative under a square root. And I hope everyone knows what that means. All that means is we actually have a complex number. I'm going to denote my complex numbers i um, just because I like it. Some people use j, uh, typically use j in electrical engineering, um, so you don't get confused with current. But personally, I find i a little bit easier to write. So there we have it. We have our solution to the characteristic equation. Now, I don't know if you've seen this root k on m before, but it's quite a significant result. Um, we're not going to go into too much detail because I want to just finish up this general solution for x of t here. But this is actually equal to the natural frequency of the system. Um, now the natural frequency is also known as the resonance frequency and we're going to talk about it in a later video in detail because it's quite important but all we know now all we need to know now is that we can substitute root k on m for omega n so we can just write this as plus or minus omega n i so there we have it this is our solution for our characteristic equation now when we're doing when we're doing uh, solutions to ODEs, um, there's there's three cases of 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 different types of solutions we can get uh, for the characteristic equation. So case one, two distinct real roots. So this is just two real numbers, which you know positive or negative, and they're distinct, so they're different. So it's five and a two, or a seven and a five, or any two numbers that are real and aren't the same. Uh, case two is real double roots. So these are any two real numbers that are identical, you know, a seven and a seven, a one and a one, a minus five and a minus five. And then our final case, case three, two complex roots, a plus or minus b i, where a is equal to the, I'm sure you've seen this notation before, the real and the b is the coefficient of the complex okay so these are our three conditions so once we found our roots over here we've got plus or minus um omega n i so we can see that uh, we have no real component here all we have is a complex component and because we have a complex component we are dealing with case three so each of these cases they have general solutions. Now, you can look these up and you'll get standardized forms for these separate equations. So once you've found um, which one we need to use, which in this case is case three, we can just go and find the standardized form, which is going to look like this. So now that we have this form, we can see that our uh, constants in here, these b's uh, just relate back to the 
constant for the complex component of the root. And this A here represents the real part of the root. And uh, these other constants, capital A and capital B, we'll explain in just a moment. So now we can pretty much just substitute in our lowercase a and lowercase b into the equation. And the nice thing is that um, this exponential, this is just going to go to 1 because when we put a 0 in the exponent, that's just going to equal 1. So what we get now when we substitute in, we get x of t is equal to a cosine omega n t plus capital B sine omega n t. And uh, just reiterating that the, the B is equal to omega n, which is equal to what we found before on M. Okay, so this is nice. So this here, this is our general solution for the spring mass system where a and b belong to the real domain so these are just unknown constants and they're real numbers and they're just unknown constants that we need to determine from initial conditions so a and b are determined from initial conditions and we're going to go into this more detail in the next video, but initial condition, for example, would be x at time 0, which is commonly denoted uh, x subscript 0, is equal to 0. Or it could be 5. It's just some number. So the mass is not starting at, at um, 0 displacement. It could be starting at 5 meters or something like that. So these initial conditions will change our our general solution such that um, you know it'll consider where the mass started out so this is our general solution um, we're going to go into more detail of how to solve this uh, capital a and capital b constants in the next video next video we're going to focus on um, using initial conditions to get our final final solution for this uh, not just the general solution and we're also going to talk about resonance, our, our omega n here, and um, talk about what it means, what it means for a for a vibrating system and what we have to be careful about. So thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.